Welcome everyone to another GSL qualifier. This time we have in the bottom right, Scarlet, and in the top left, SOS. So both very interesting players to be trying to make it through GSL. Scarlet's obviously a non-Korean. Uh, this is not her first time trying to make it into GSL, of course. She has made it many times before. And then SOS, who uh, has also made GSL many times before and uh, is trying to do so again after coming back from military service. So uh, some of the Protoss that people are, are hoping will come back are trying to come back. I also cast a stats qualifying match you can find on the same YouTube here. And while that one wasn't the one that he actually made it through, I believe there is still a chance for him to do so because there's two rounds for the GSL. And then in both of those rounds, there's the like upper and lower bracket basically. So, you know, this kind of almost guarantees those who you would expect to make it into GSL. Although really not so much a guarantee because I believe, uh, spoiler alert, like Ragnarok didn't make it through, which uh, a couple of people were surprised by. But anywho, just to clear that out, I suppose, I'm not exactly certain which part of the GSL group this is in. So I should probably go figure that out to see whoever loses, if they have another chance. But first, I do want to mention that Scarlet went for a, um, <clears throat> it looked like an extractor trick and then a 15 hatch uh, pool and then a pool. So 15 hatch, 15 pool is what it looked like. Which doesn't make any sense. It must have been 14 hatch and 15 pool. Hey, the point is, though, she's going for early uh, hatchery, early pool. This is kind of uh, made around and then did seem to disappear. So I'm a little surprised to see her actually doing this. I remember talking about it a few months ago and then uh, some people saying, you know, it's, it's the future. And then it just stopped happening. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen more often in this matchup. I was seeing uh, Solar do it in ZVT, which I was kind of uh, theorizing maybe was a response to this forward two racks meta that we're in. But then again, that also disappeared. So I mean, it's, it's more used to seeing it in this. You certainly guarantee that hatchery down on your natural location. And then you do have uh, this faster queens, right? So not that I... Maybe again, like those faster queens are helpful versus the Reapers in the other matchup, but are they necessarily helpful here? I'm not sure, but Scarlet obviously prefers to do this. So, I mean, sometimes we see this go into a cheese, actually, but that's been years since I've had that happen. Uh, who was really good at that? Zancer. Zancer was really good at that. Actually doing this um, kind of just to fake the Protoss out. And the Protoss wouldn't really connect the dots about how much quicker these things were. And then he just floodlings. But I don't think anyone does that anymore. We're talking a good five years ago. Anywho, so I would say that Scarlet is actually favored coming in here. That uh, SOS as, you know, the returnee here is, is going to be a little less involved in StarCraft 2 leading up to the GSL qualifiers. Whereas Scarlet, you know, never really, I would say never really stops, but she did actually stop around. Um, end of Heart of the Swarm, beginning of Legacy of the Void for a little while, then she came back and, you know, had all the accolades that she did. So, with Legacy of the Void being seven years old now? Ouch. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she's been around for a while. Uh, now, what does that mean for SOS specifically? Now, SOS is definitely a trickster. One of his last matches before he went into the military was actually during the COVID years. Uh, one of the season finals, and he actually ended up proxy nexusing. Uh, I, I don't know if that's proxy nexus, aggressive nexus. I don't know what you're going to call it. <laughs> it's a PvP, and the nexus is right here. Uh, definitely an interesting character, that's for sure, and why people are so excited to see him come back. Um, but that means that he's going to have to kind of get up to date on some of the newer tricks, I suppose, the newer ways that Protoss are playing in order to make his tricks work, I would say, basically. It's like, first, you have to learn the rules to break the rules, right? And so SOS might be in the process of doing that although this actually is not so much uh unique we have seen this quick double stargate into fleet beacon before across many years of starcraft 2 but then also in particular lately um not often but lately we have seen even hero try and do this now sometimes it's done off of a face value kind of a depth pressure sometimes it's done while you get that third nexus up right and then it's a little more um, difficult to tell what the follow-up is from the Protoss. The longer that SOS does not reach towards this third base, the more that Scarlet gets suspicious and the more that she should be at, at least thinking about the possibility of this, seeing as it was a Stargate opener into a Void Ray to clear out any amount of Overlords that would be able to get in and see. 
Whereas I've obviously went to an Oracle and three Oracles, like you wouldn't a lot of normal PBZs. Nothing would stop the, the Overlords. So, like I said, the more that uh, Scarlet doesn't see a third base, the more that she should be wary of something like this. Now, it's not the only thing a Protoss can do on an extended two base setup. If she had seen all of the gases somehow, like the Overlord hadn't died yet, then she actually would even further be suspicious of exactly this, but she hasn't seen that either. So, for all she knows, this is one hell of a late charge let all in. <laughs> <laughs> which obviously is not it. So more and more and more, as you see nothing, 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 but attempts to kind of macro out, more and more you should be suspecting this quick carrier thing. And this quick carrier thing can't snowball. This can actually find some of the initial queens out in the front lines, kill them, and then that's how the snowball starts, because unfortunately getting to Aspire and Corrupt there is just not, hap not happening very quickly. This will be Scarlet's first actual scout on the carriers as the Interceptors come along to try and safeguard the third Nexus. Scarlet did build a decent amount of lings to try and get that cancel, realizing that the amount of ground army would be quite low, only working off of two gateways. However, not timing it out necessarily all that well, Nexus was kind of healthy, and the carriers had actually already popped out. Now, this is where we get really quite concerned. If Scarlet is able to bulk up her queens, of which she has eight, so she was adding on a few extra as she figured this out, and then, of course, now is just going to spam queens as long as she can, uh, then she's fine. If there were two queens creeping, um, then they're dead. If they find, like, two over here guarding against a would-be oracle, they're dead. That's how you get down to four queens, and then suddenly that's not enough for the carriers to... Uh, for them to deal with the carriers. <clears throat> but the eight queens all together is actually fine. A couple of transfuses as well. And then SOS not actually able to get like all of the interceptors out here. And then literally out of the carrier itself means that it's it's not the best carrier possible. So the queens actually have no trouble whatsoever dealing with this. So far, the first plan of SOS's entire build here has not worked out. And then interestingly enough, is going into Resident Evil Lives. I mentioned that this sometimes happens in reverse. And then it kind of conceals the Stargate presence a little bit more. But to go into Resident Evil Lives... That's interesting. I don't, I don't, uh, huh. Did Hero do this before? Maybe he has. It's been a while. <laughs> been casting so many TDPs lately. I don't know, uh, but Queens are still doing the trick. 12 Queens, still able to combat four carriers. A couple of Spores also on the front lines. A nice little addition. Corruptors are on the way. Uh, and the, the Queens, if they could target fire the carrier, more power to them. Gonna go up the Void Ray, now jump on top of one of the carriers. The weakened one not being targeted, and the Queens are starting to go down here. One carrier is forced to pull back, but the Interceptor is still out, tearing down the Queen numbers. A carrier does go down. Another carrier now under threat, losing its shields, down to about half health, but the last Queen will fall here. But good news is, 10 Corruptors in the nick of time now have one carrier that they're gonna go after to take that down instantly. Boom, there you go. Second carrier actually also going to fall before the recall actually happens. These surprise adepts come in here and they are a hell of a surprise, but Scarlet did make at least some ground army, expecting probably more so charge lots if I had to guess, but all the same, something to actually deal with these pesky adepts, which misfire on an extractor. So far, only six drones killed it is not bad at all. When the adepts are still going, so we'll see if that count rises, but the corruptors went for a counter offensive. They're gonna be able to grab one carrier despite the shield body overcharge. Soccer's get warped in but it's not going to be enough. The Corruptors get the carrier, and they're going to get away, actually. I don't believe any of them died. Okay, one died, but four carriers have gone down. All of SOS's air potential is now dead, and his only potential now is for these adepts to kill a heck of a lot more drones than they have. Scarlet's still at 54 is certainly a manageable number. She's on four bases. As soon as she actually clears the adepts out, she can get back to building up that drone count and then back to being on the offensive on the ground as she realizes that the air play is no longer the goal of SOS. All the carriers are dead. The Corruptors can go in and camp the Stargates, see if they're not working, and go, oh, okay, it's back in the ground. In which case, just maxing out on Roach Ravager will probably still do the trick because SOS is really starting this very late. He's a late bloomer when it comes to the ground Protoss army. Main Nexus will not be going down, which is uh, good news for SOS. He also looks to chase this down, too, but the blink upgrade only, like, 30% done means the Corruptors will be able to tuck themselves into a corner and be basically an ever-present threat. Kind of like a dropship back there. 
And while their supply is considerable, 11 Corruptors not helping out on the ground, which we're now focused on, I would say that that threat still matters, and the overall situation still heavily favors Scarlet. Just because she has however much supply that is uh, in Corruptors doesn't mean that she can't max out on a still very, well, let's say decent Roach Ravager army, because we know Roach Ravager does start to fall off the longer a ZVP goes, but it's just the matter of SOS starting this transition so late and really not finding the damage that he would have preferred. If Scarlet had been surprised by the carrier, she stumbles there. Then she's a little surprised by the adept, she stumbles there. She's down all of her queens. She's down probably 20 or 30 drones. Her uh, corruptors came out like one at a time, so she's actually down to like four. And they didn't kill all the carriers. The carrier's still a threat, and she has to choose between corruptors and roaches. You can see how it gets actually very chaotic very quickly if the plan works out for the Protoss. But if it doesn't, then you just have kind of like all these stopping points, these hiccups that the Protoss has to deal with while they try to transition, and, and the Zerg is not is not hiccuping. They're not they're not faltering. Um, at least a confident Zerg it doesn't, and Scarlet is certainly confident here. Moving across the map with that max out Roach Ravager army, like I said, it's it's decent just because it's Roach Ravager with Corruptor Supply taking it up, and it's already inflated, we know that. But doesn't, you know, decent is going to be good enough here. Although an Overseer is necessary, so that's a little awkward. Okay, the Overseer is available, actually, but she's also returning back to defend her third base from a Blink Stalker run by. SOS uh, potentially giving up a lot of Stalkers to do this, you know? I mean, maybe they buy enough time, and that's preferable, but the Stalkers are starting to go down. The DTs made themselves known, so she should be adding on spores and spines, already having a couple every which way. And behind all of this, Scarlet wasn't just literally all leaning on Roach Ravager, which would have been a problem, as SOS does manage to buy time. If Scarlet was literally all in here, SOS is working off of four bases, builds up to about 150 supply, that's when you can actually start really holding against pure Roach Ravager. But Scarlet is getting upgrades, banelings, a hive technology as well. And she is still definitely favored to win. 70 supply lead for her. 40 in army supply, which actually isn't that impressive for a Zerg player. We have Archons and Shield Battery and Charge Lot with 1-1 one, one coming in. And you can see that the Roach Ravager is starting to fall a little bit. But part of that, I guess, was a bit of a ruse. The Nexus actually went down. Now, will it be worth it? Oh, my God. The Curse of Biles hit so many Stalkers. Now, the Remax is very quick for Scarlet. So as long as she's trading out in any sort of way, it's going to be good enough. And she absolutely is. SOS overreaching at this point. He realizes the reinforcements are flooding in. Now forced to back away as he tries to replace this Nexus, SOS is supply in the gutter, and Scarlet should be able to win with that Remax and just A move forward. Is there anything else interrupting her? So far, no. A Warp Prism is warping in those harassing DTs, but is it going to be enough? Is it too late? The Spine and Spore are ready at Scarlet's fifth base to defend that. And two DTs will not be able to break it, so it looks like she's fine at home, continuing to attack on SOS's fourth. That's a kill, not a cancel. And SOS is on the ropes. He's been on the ropes for a while, I suppose, but now he's basically almost falling off. He's, uh, he's about to get out of the ring. A warp Prism in the main, ineffective, as the queens have been rebuilt, and her... Well, some of them, anyway. <laughs> Scarlet, surprisingly, not having a, a larva problem, although being based on Roach Ravager does make larva life easier. She had four bases up and running for most of this game, too, and a fifth, obviously, as well, so I guess it does explain some things, but yeah, three queens would usually be a light number. Oh, now up to four. That's not a problem, though. That is absolutely not a problem. She does not choose to just, A, move forward. She gets her ducks in a row back at home, but she does still max out. Has an additional upgrade? Oh no, she's still on plus two missile. Finished a plus one air at some point. I mean, maybe just in case there was a transition back into carriers. And has also added in those banelings, which should be good enough. Force fields being broken by the Cross of Biles. Archons being popped. Many overseers available, so no sneaky DTs to ruin her day. And this looks like it will be it, especially as the Corruptors go to pee on a natural nexus. SOS's army supply now a quarter of his opponents. His last warp in will probably, in fact, be the last. And that is it. Scarlet takes game number one against SOS. Now into game two on Gressvon in the bottom right up a game. It is Scarlet. And in the top left, we do have SOS. And I've got an update for you guys. I went and did some research, and I can tell you that this is actually round two, loser's bracket. This is the last chance for these two to qualify into GSL. 
So quite the uh, stressful predicament, I suppose. And they had played actually in the upper bracket of round two in which SOS was able to win 2-1. Scarlet has shown some vulnerability to Protoss, uh, definitely a known dislike of Protoss, even though she also plays Protoss at a very high level. Um, but, I mean, that's really not a secret. That's not me trying to reveal something. Like, she talks about it. Like, literally, her clan tag will be adepted or something like that. So, we know that. And I think, in particular, the trickier Protoss can be so obnoxious to play against. And SOS is certainly one tricky Protoss. He tried to be tricky in the last game, but I think it was kind of on the nose. I think it actually was... Um, it wasn't veiled, which is usually one of the better things that a Protoss can do to make those tricks work, right? I mean, there was a time in which they could do Immortal Sentry All-Ins regardless of whether the Zerg knew or not. And, and it would work. Half the time, <laughs> at least. But, you know, it's, it's not been that way for a while. If they do have to be... If they want to be tricky, they got to be tricky. They actually got to kind of make something look different than the other and then what they're actually doing. And Zerg players have also gotten so good at discovering these things, figuring these things out. I mean, I think Serral would be a, a big reason as to that. Serral just seems to have made it so that Zergs don't have to be surprised. Every time someone thinks, oh my God, this Zerg player is gonna get surprised and he's gonna die, uh, Serral would, would not. I mean, even as recently as Gamers 8, where he just barely held against a totally unseen charge all-in, one of the classic fastest all-ins you can do. He was totally surprised, and he still managed to survive. Crater kind of messed up, to be fair. But the, the point is, so the, there's been leaps and bounds forward in the matchup that, you know, some players do lead the charge, other players can can learn from and adapt their own style, whatever it is. And yeah, it would also have to be a little bit trickier than what I think SOS was showing there, which was not obvious, because I think there's always some indecision, and that is the trouble of playing Zerg. It's uh, unless you start off with like a 12 pool into a early all in into a weird kind of did enough damage macro game. You're not the one necessarily in charge. So, yeah, it was late enough not to be one of those early like charge all ins. The third base definitely pointed to something tricky on two bases. And if it's not going to be one of those early all lanes, you don't see a lot of units being made then you you start to put things together, but there's always that little bit of a doubt in your mind. But obviously Scarlet chose the right thing to do. She got a Roachborn, she prepared for something that could be trickier. Like if she had to build Roaches, she could have, but then she was also building those Queens. And like I said, I think she was kind of figuring it out. It was a, it was a little more blatant. And then some of the transitional uh, games that like Hero has been playing into those two Stargates and they didn't work out. So, I mean, she might've been, a little surprise in their previous match. For all I know, SOS tried the exact same thing or did do some type of two-base charge all in and was playing off of that, but just ineffectively. Uh, but yeah, it didn't work. So kudos to Scarlet for trying to, you know, figure out and adapt on the fly as she's playing through this tournament against the trickiest Protoss who's probably ever existed. Twilight Council is coming down for SOS at this point after a Stargate opener into Voidray once again. So kind of setting that baseline that is Voidray block scouting X, Y, or Z is on the way. You don't know. And in this case, it's not going to be the Stargate. It is going to be the uh, Twilight Council. And this was kind of cute. I do like this. SOS building that fourth gas so that the Overlord could see it. So that it looks like it's another two-base Stargate play. And then canceling it. And there's not much that Scarlet can do to, to, you know, think past that. I mean, if you start thinking about what if he's, he knows that I know that he knows that I know that, he, I, you, that you're just going to get into a trap. So the best case scenario for her, again, might just be exactly what she did last game, which is get the Roach Warren, prepare for something that's on the ground, but then also get a decent number of queens, maybe a couple more than you usually would. Unfortunately... It looks like she might be caught by surprise. Evolution Chamber is coming down, possibly for fast plus one missile. Sorry, melee. Um, which which won't be all that helpful. <laughs> it's their present enclaves. Ay, ay, ay. Hmm. A little bit worried. A little bit worried. SOS. Resident Glaives, 80% done. Has that going to be with a War Prism? So there's not going to be that instant reinforcement. Scarlet might be able to tackle this initially and because there are no instant warp ins okay there's the scout right there from the links uh because there's no instant warp ins be able to handle it but i don't know if it's going to be handled gracefully 
She knows, but there's only so much she can do. Busting out as many lings as possible, connect collecting her queens together. I mean, those are all the best things she can do at this point in time. Target firing each uh, individual adept as so she builds up the lings and tries to stop the adepts from getting into any particularly bad area. I mean, they're not really hitting the drones, so the Ling's able to trade out, you know, ineffectively against Resident Glaives, but still, while the drones remain safe, they do chase down the uh, shades, but the drones have already moved on, so the adepts that end up staying in the natural are denying mining time, but they're not really doing much else. Now they're wasting shots once again on the extractor. SOS two times, two games in a row, not showing the best adept micro. And in this case, this was one of the easiest adept holds that Scarlet's probably made. Definitely no Neve adept micro coming out from SOS, if I uh, may be so bold as a compare to a North American. Neve's definitely better. <laughs> oh, SOS might be showing some of his rust. He's, he definitely was playing at a very high level when adepts were a thing. No, no doubt about that, but uh, not, not at that, that, this, that this time. Scarlet able to hold uh, with pure Ling Queen. And some might say just because, you know, queens are good, that's why. But that's not really the issue. Um, and then also when she was all macroing fairly well, too. It's not like she stopped at 40 drones to make all these lings to hold. She's uh, at the 63, four bases. Moving on to roaches, too. A little bit sturdier, so less uh, less chance of the adept actually getting a second chance of snowballing, basically. And the adept immortal sentry follow-up is going to be... Something that could be very dangerous to pure Ling, but adding a couple of Ravagers and boom, that is Legacy of the Void. That makes this hold a lot easier. Easier, but not guaranteed, as we still don't have any Ravagers. Scarlet actually entirely unaware of the movement of this army, or even the, the presence of this army. Otherwise, I think she would have been building Ravagers a lot faster. One spine crawler is going to get taken down instantly. Drones locked in by the force field. Unfortunately, cannot escape, but they're also not being targeted either. So not the worst case scenario. The drones will eventually escape. And Scarlet is getting more time to build up more army, more lings, more Ravagers on the way. Queens once again full to the forward position as well. And so far, the force field is really not making a huge impact. A couple of queens caught behind them. That's something. But now the adepts are threatening a shade, but they can't really. Otherwise, the sentry in a Mortal will be overwhelmed. Protoss might be overwhelmed anyway as Scarlet takes the fight. Many units on the backs out of those force fields not interacting. The Lings are stuck behind there too, but the Ravager is still alive. More Roaches on the way. And SOS now going to lose the War Prism. Tried to get out of there, but not in time. Is now relying on the Adepts to once again get an extraordinary number of drone kills. Something they could not do in last game or the first attack in this game. And now they look to once again be failing. Only five Five drones killed as they shade nowhere close to a drone line. Scarlet Supply might not look particularly healthy, but SOS's position also looking quite bad, especially as many of these units do in fact get chased down. SOS is on three bases, struggling to spend his money, and with no additional technology, is looking like a 2-0 here, or 0-2 for him. Without charge, the mineral dump isn't really going to be all that effective. <laughs> He's warping in zealots, but they don't have charge. Uh, and then, you know, besides, even if he did have charge, he'd be so equally microed against. There's hardly any force fields. There's nothing to chase down a roach ravager. Scarlet knows she's got this. this is SOS. That was actually a surprise. That was the trick that I was I was thinking of, and then just not the best execution. I mean, Scarlet had some very good last second scouting. In last second uh, handling of an emergency situation, sure, but um, yeah, SOS, not, not able to find any success. So Scarlet gets her revenge at the most important point of the GSL qualifier. That means that Scarlet qualifies, and unfortunately for the Protoss and SOS fans out there, SOS does not. And that's going to be it for this particular best of three qualifying match. More to come, guys, on this YouTube channel. So please like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. And I'll see you later for more StarCraft.